yeah. Oh. No, that's fine. So that's I don't know what's happened. Yeah. Oh, is that you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So um, that's it for me. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> no problem. So you know, you know, um, I think for me, what I wanted to sh the first question, and I think this is to start off with, Tess, is mm. it's so hard for job seekers to find work. Hmm. Why do you think it is? What are your thoughts on, I mean, you know, so many people are saying, you know, Shirley, I'm just one person. I just need one job. Hmm. Why can't I get hmm. a job? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the, the, the market is very competitive at the moment. And there are a lot of applicants. Um, we've got a lot of, a lot of candidates and few positions. And I think um, we also, they're looking for specific skills. Our clients are looking for specific skills, which we seem to have, a shortage of so there is a high unemployment rate yeah i think i hear you on that and it's funny over the years i've often had candidates saying you know nobody wants to give me a chance i've got no experience and i remember when i left varsity i remember going and applying for jobs and most people said oh you need two years experience and um i remember thinking why won't people give me a chance i almost felt like they owed me a chance you know and i think the one thing i've realized is is that a lot of employers don't have the time they don't have the capacity to train new people and induct new people and i think a lot of businesses are cut down to the why they lean and and really they just they're just trying to get by so i think that's that's a problem also, the other mm -hmm. thing that we've found in the marketplace is that there's so much, there's such a shortage of high level skill in certain areas. So if I said to you, what, what does that mean? It means um, certain areas such as like um, IT software developers, we literally cannot get enough of those. Now, I, I'm sure on this call, there are no software developers because they've probably all been snatched up in the marketplace. So I think one of the things that I would encourage you or ask you as, as a job seeker is, what is your scarce skill? What do you mm -hmm. have to offer that maybe not everybody else has? Um, and, and you might say, well, that's hard to say because I'm not educated enough or I don't have a qualification. But I think, I think what we want to do whenever we are looking for a job, we're positioning ourselves is to say, this is my X factor. This is my unique skill. And it could be something as simple as I have the most amazing warm personality and I'm brilliant in a frontline role. Or I have such mm -hmm. enduring patience that when I deal with customers, there's, there's no problem. I never have a problem. I never get upset. Uh, you know, it could be things like that. It doesn't have to be um, I'm a software developer or I have a, a doctorate in something, not at all. Um, you know, Tess, you know, a lot of job seekers make mistakes and they might not know that they're making those mistakes. And today is really a soft space. Um, at the end, we're going to let you ask lots of questions as well. So, so just uh, keep some questions going if you've got any. But Tess, you know, mm. I always think, what are the biggest mistakes job seekers make that if they know about it, then they know not to make them? You know, mm. you know you've had so much experience in, in recruitment. What do you think they are? Well, I think the first thing is their CV. So your yeah. CV is selling you, it's marketing you. So is your CV a portrayal of who you are? And I think a lot of candidates um, have a lot of information. They've got outdated CVs. They've got uh, old templates. They, they um, put too much information. And um, they, they often would post or send their CV to multiple positions and they're perhaps not in line with any of those positions that they've applied for so I think let's just you know go back to to the CV is your CV marketing yourself is it have you got all the, the correct information are the dates correct is your spelling correct um, and 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 I think that's the first thing there are so many templates available um, on, on various sites. And, and I think the first thing is to make sure that your CV is, is marketing yourself and, and, and saying, says who you are. I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't know if anyone on this call has ever been at a robot and somebody's handing out brochures um, to market a car dealership or a, a housing estate or a new business. And you look at that brochure and you make a decision whether to throw it away or whether to keep it. 
And I think your CV is your brochure. So if you see it as this is my advertising tool. So when an employer or potential employer or recruiter looks at that, they're actually judging me based on this. So I would also encourage uh, candidates, believe it or not, most recruiters are spending six, six seconds, not much more than that, glancing through your CV before deciding book in or, 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 or take the person seriously or regret often because there's three, four, 500 applicants for a role. So I think the one thing is, um, just if I look at mistakes that people make, like Tess said, some people apply for every job. So even if you do see a developer and you've never done IT, well, I can do it. Um, sometimes people think, well, I'll apply because you know they might have another job, but sometimes what that does is it actually um, and can put you off. So some agencies mm -hmm. will say, oh, this person applies for every single job. And then the other thing that 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 I find people must never do. So let's be honest, say you've got a list of 30 recruiters that you've heard of, their names, the email address, and what you could do is um, what some people do is they clump them all together in one email and then they send to all and then they just mm. send their CV. So it's not, dear Cindy, I'm applying for your bookkeeper to balance sheet position advertised on PNET. It's just mm. sent to everyone. And often what happens is if you don't have the time and courtesy to go, hi, Cindy, I'm looking for a job. Why mm. should I take the time and extend the courtesy to say, hi, Johnny, hi, Susie, hi, Sipo. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing available. So I think sometimes people shoot themselves in the foot. The other thing I've noticed, Tess, is sometimes people think that a long-winded um, a long-winded uh, discussion about the plot might help. Mm. Um, sometimes what happens is we, I'll, I'll receive... Um, it's almost like an essay, two pages of yeah. this is me. You don't understand what I've been through. This is, it doesn't really help your application at all, unfortunately. Um, and if anything, it's making it harder for a, a recruiter or an employer to do their job. So I think just advertise why you are um, looking out there for, for a role. I think that's important, which role you're applying for and then and then see what you can do, uh, what 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 comes of it there. So I think the, the thing is don't apply for every job if they're not suited to you. Um, you're seen, um, you know, I think, I think that's important. Um, uh, I also think a lot of people are not doing enough to find a job. Now you might say that's bizarre, but I almost see it as, we need to make it a job to find a job because sometimes what people will do, they'll say to me, Cindy, I'm so glad I've chatted to you. I'm so glad you have inter you've interviewed me. Now, um, now my, my problem is solved. Um, you know, I might not have any clients looking for your skills in the time that you're looking. So we really, really want to, to um, have as many opportunities open as possible. So you need a multi-pronged strategy. So if I said to you, like for me to market my business, I can't just be on LinkedIn or just on PNET. We have to do at least 10 different things. So if I said to you, what are the 10 different things you are doing to find a job? So um, Tess, can you think of certain things that people can do, like the different elements, like I know going on LinkedIn and having a LinkedIn profile, anything else that you could share just off the top of your head? Well, I think like, all the social, pla all the platforms, the, the Facebook, yes. uh, registering with the, the different platforms, PNET, Career Junction, you've got to get the word out, I think. And, and also word of mouth. It's not what, but who you know. So mm. it's, it's to, to tell your friends as well and, and ask them to, can they get their CV out there for you? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, mm. you know, it's funny, when I was at Varsity, this is many, many years ago, I had a friend who had a little black book. <laughs> it sounds crazy. But everyone he met who was a someone or who, who was influential, he wrote their name down and their contact details. But it's almost, have you contacted the people you know or the people you know who know people to say, I am available. I'm looking for mm. opportunities. I think that's so important. And then, yeah. you know, I, I hit up a recruitment agency, but I never knew how agencies worked until I worked in one. So basically, if you think about it, employers approach an agency to find them the staff that they are looking for in terms of the skills and experience and qualifications. It's it's not necessarily the other way around. So, so that is possibly why some people are getting frustrated. So if you think about it, we are there, we've got our clients who say, I need this, I need this, and we are there to serve those clients' needs. So I understand um, some days, some days we, we, we get 500 CVs 
you can probably interview mm -hmm. six, seven people a day. And that's yeah. why you're so frustrated so, so many times. We're so going, the agencies don't care. The agencies, well, the agencies are just drowning. They're drowning in applicants and they're often unsuitable applicants because people are desperate and they're looking for jobs. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't do the same, but I'm just saying it doesn't, it doesn't actually work as effectively. But now, Tess, you know, the CV mm -hmm. is so important. Um, do you have any tips on, okay, you, so I'm, I'm a candidate, I see a job, I want to apply, but I kind of know my CV is not great. Any any mm -hmm. tips on how they, they can get their CV to be even better? Well, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a variety of templates that are available. Um, I mean, you, I, I don't actually have any links um, at the moment, but um, there's even in Word, uh, there's a standard format. Choose one that's clear, that's easy to read, um, and that you can just pop in your information, one or two pages, that's enough. Um, you, you don't need to do more than that. Okay. And any other um, tips on your CV? What else, what else should people be doing? So I, I, for me, people put too much information. I know you need to have enough, yes. but not too much. You know, I always want to say to candidates, you, as a recruiter, we're human. <laughs> so we can also only see as much information and we are reading 100, 200 CVs. So we want to pick, um, see the, the highlighted points. What is going to attract me to that person? Ah, oh, they've got their degree. Ah, oh, they've got this experience. And then that draws me to that um, CV, but if it's too much to read, if the covering letter's too long, we really don't have the, the time to, to go through all of that as well, because we've got lots of applications. So make sure it's clear, um, make sure it's easy to read. It's like a, like a marketing ad. When you see an advert, something that catches your eye, you want it to be easy on the eye and uh, relevant. The information needs to be relevant. Um, yeah, so I think those are my top tips for, for your CV. Fantastic. I see somebody just put something on the chat. Is LinkedIn important? Um, Tessa, do you think somebody should be on LinkedIn? Definitely. For a job? But what yes. if somebody says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a cashier or I'm a, I'm a receptionist or I'm an admin clerk. Do you think there's space for them on LinkedIn? Do you think it could help? Well, look, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's the awareness. I think that's what's important. It's, it's perhaps there might not be um, a job for that specific skill, but it, it's, it's broadening your awareness. And when you link to somebody else, they might link you to somebody else. And then it opens your network. So yes, I do believe LinkedIn for, for job seekers and for professional, uh, for work, definitely. Facebook is more for the social, the social side of things. So Absolutely. yes, uh, yeah, LinkedIn is important. And also talking about that, I see a lot of there are a lot of employment groups on Facebook as well, where people are, are stating I'm unemployed or people are saying I need yes. staff. And I know a lot of people yes. are using those platforms fairly effectively. Um, yes. Just on LinkedIn, you know, I got a, um, a little notification from LinkedIn the other day. It said, did you know that 1,358 of your contacts were placed last year? And it said wow. that every 15 seconds, somebody is placed on LinkedIn. So I think it does depend on where you're at. But like I was saying earlier, that it's one of your shop windows. Now, I think mm -hmm. one of the biggest frustrations for so many people who've possibly been impacted by COVID in the last couple of, um, of last two years has been, it's been a lot harder to get out there. You normally could have popped into an office and walked in and dropped your CV off mm. and people say, we're not taking CVs. You want an in, a face-to-face -face interview and people say, we're not interviewing. Um, you would have networked through your church or your kid's school or through going to networking events and now none of those things are available. So mm. I think personally that anybody who is looking for a job needs to take advantage of any and all of those social media um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, portals and and opportunities because that's really what we what we need you know we really really need to use those to our advantage oh, yes sorry oh, okay. i'm just muting someone here sorry um so i think i think that's so so important so i would put up a nice linkedin profile you never know who's looking for staff and yeah. you don't want to not have done it and then mm. um it was to your disadvantage just also mm. just a couple of do's and don'ts about CVs. Um, I remember once, you're going to laugh at this, guys, but I interviewed a 19-year-old young lady and she had a 19-page CV. 
<laughs> and I sat there with this long CV. But the thing is, um, she'd included something like she'd raised like 80 rand for feed the babies. If that's your greatest achievement, you need to hide it. You know, people want to see mm -hmm. an achievement. Otherwise, just just don't put something mm -hmm. so useless. Uh, you know what I mean? Like I, I came third in the cup and spoon race and <laughs> in grade one. Nobody wants to see that. So, And also people are more interested in your more recent experience mm -hmm. than your experience of 10 years ago. So one, uh, just a couple of things from my side. You might want a short one-page CV with a little head and shoulders photo professionally, not done in the bathroom selfie, you know, one of those, or mm -hmm. in the car. Um, and, and a three-page CV. I think that's important. I would also say, please don't lie on your CV. It's so tempting to say, mm -hmm. you know, if you were dismissed from a job, um, to say, left for better, better prospects, or to leave a job out of your CV because it didn't work out, or to embellish, say things like, oh, yes, um, I'm a, a proficient on Excel, you know, whereas you have you've you barely know the basics. You know, I think mm -hmm. rather be honest and be accurate about those things because um, often if you go for an interview they will um, assess you or they will test you and remember that the one area where you can be summarily dismissed from a job is if you lie about something related to your qualifications or skills so let's say you say I, I want to be an accountant and you say I've got a BCom but so under qualifications you write BCom but you're still studying it. So you actually don't have this qualification. So either you write qualifications, BCom, still studying, or you do studies, BCom, second year in progress. But otherwise, what you might do is it's almost like an error of omission. You might, it might not be meant to be a lie, but um, I know personally two men who, who lost their jobs because both of them, over different periods of time, had said that they had a BCom when in fact they didn't. And they were told immediately go. Um, also make sure, like Tess said, there's no mistakes. Um, make sure the font is easy to read, nothing fancy and nothing that smacks of 1970s, I think. And mm -hmm. also you start with your most recent job first. You put the dates and don't put 2019 to 2020. What does that mean? Was it December 2019 to January 2020? That's only 13, 14 months. Or was it three years? So I think that's an important thing to do. Um, and then um, I think um, at the top, I would highlight what makes me special. What what are my top achievements? What what I offer to an employer? So mm -hmm. you could say I'm a I'm a you know customer oriented um, um, customer service professional with a servant heart, and I always go the extra mile. And I'm a great team player. I mean, obviously, you'd say it in some in 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 the best possible English. But something that somebody goes, oh, we need somebody like that. I like the way they said that. And often mm -hmm. it's just those little things that people go, oh, something about this candidate. Um, reason for leaving. You 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 want to include that. Um, and just be careful of of everything being personal to be discussed. Um, conflict. You know, those are red flags for us. Gaps in CVs are big red flags for us. We, we, if you know, it's terrible. As recruiters, we are so cynical and suspicious. So, if I saw that you had a five-year gap in your CV, the first thing I think is Westfall Prison. I think you've been in prison. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Meanwhile, you might have had your own business. You might have stayed at home and raised the children. But just explain those gaps. And you know what we want to see in your CV is progress. So you started your CV, your, your job, maybe you, you were a cashier, then you became an admin person, and then you were a secretary, and then you were the personal uh, assistant, and then you were the admin manager. That's beautiful progression as an example. Um, and then the other thing is salary, uh, salary requirements. Tess, what are your thoughts on that? Um, should people write what salary they want? What is your view on salary requirements? I, th I think they actually should because it gives us an idea of where they see themselves in the market or what, where they've been and what they're actually currently on. Um, you know, you have some people that are in at one level and th then they, they're actually asking for more. So I, I think it's important to be transparent and to say what it is that they're looking for, what they're currently on. Okay. And then, you know, I know, I know that often candidates will say, these are my referees. But mm. these are the people who are going to give me a reference, but they haven't contacted them. What is your advice on that? Um, what do you mean? To, to say that, that they, they 
on, on connecting with the referees beforehand. You know, nobody likes a surprise. Oh, I, uh, I didn't know I had to give a reference or I didn't know I was put down. What are your thoughts? Oh, no, I think, yeah. I think it's important that the candidate um, gets hold of the person and that they know that they must expect a call for a reference. I think that's important. Um, also for them to be open to say, I am in the job market and I've spoken to uh, my previous employer and yes, they're going to, you can expect a call from them. And I think that's important. Okay. And then I think an important thing as well is never ask a colleague um, or a subordinate to give a reference. Um, we've had a few yeah. situations where candidates have, because they haven't got a good relationship with their line manager or the, or the, the owner or the, the manager of the company, they ask a uh, uh, a, you know, a, a fellow person, a fellow colleague to do that. And um, and often never ask anyone to lie and say they're your boss because whenever we've had those situations, it's it's never turned out well. But now mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is now we get to the interview. We finally get mm -hmm. that interview and mm -hmm. then it just is terrible. We, we, we walk out of there or we get off that Zoom call and we go, oh my gosh, I know I'm not getting that job. So Tess, mm -hmm. I mean, I know you, mm -hmm. you've dealt with thousands and thousands of candidates over the years what are your tips what are there do's and don'ts are there golden rules that people can um apply to themselves mm. well for me the the, the biggest thing is preparation okay. you do need to prepare <laughs> yes you know often people oh i've got an interview but now you need the, the basic questions in your mind and these are the standard questions tell me about yourself what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? I think even if they don't ask you that outright, it's important for you to know that because during the interview, at any point, you can go, well, yes, I am good at this. Yes, this is what I can offer you. Yes, these are my strengths. And um, at, at any given time, if you feel confident or I know going in there, this is what I can offer, it's the start of a good of a good interview. What I want to say is it's so important, though, to be spontaneous. I've had a lot of students that go, no, let me practice again. I'm going to say, these are my strengths. I'm good at this. I'm good at that. And then it becomes like a monologue. It, it doesn't become natural. It doesn't, it's not, um, it doesn't seem like they're themselves. So I want to say to the candidates, always be yourself. Um, if you don't know the answer, it's okay. You can just be honest. Don't lie and don't make up an answer that you think they would want to hear. So that's for me, is it's very important. Um, obviously, under preparation, you need to find out as much as you can about the company. Um, what is the job spec? What are the requirements of the job? Do your um, strengths align with what the job spec is asking. And, and for me, that's important. If the job spec says you need to be a good communicator, um, be, um, I don't know, um, adventurous and this, this and this, then you need to say that. So your job needs, your um, answers need to mirror the, the job application. Another thing um, that I often find candidates, they don't listen. So they hear one or two words and then they go, oh, I've got the answer. And they, <laughs> they just speak, they just talk, but they haven't heard what is the actual question? How do I, how do I answer that question without um, rattling off, should I say? So you need to give some thought to how you structure your answers. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, the STAR technique, which is um, your situation, task, action, result. So a lot of interviewers ask behavioral-based questions or competency-based questions. So what that means is um, you asked a question of how you responded in the, in the past and how did you actually manage that uh, problem and, and and how did you solve it? So if you answer with a star technique, so this was my situation, this was the um, how I um, the task, this is what I did. My action was how did you complete the task, and your result is what is the actual outcome. So it has some structure to how you answer that question. So okay. I can go, I can chat a lot more about behavioural based questions, but um, I don't know. If there's anything you'd like to 
So I think what you're saying there is, so let's be honest, a client might say, we need somebody who can work really well under pressure. Have you worked mm. under pressure? Now, most of us would say, yes, I have. Mm. <laughs> I mean, no, we're not going to say no, or I'm very good under yeah. pressure. So what we, how you could answer that is, um, in my last job, so this was uh, six months ago. So it was in August last year. Um, my company had a very, very busy time. We had a one month project that we had a massive deadline. We didn't think we were going to make it. What I did is I chose to come in two hours early every day. I took work home. I worked every Saturday on my own bat because I knew we had to get this deadline done. And at the end, we re we reached our deadline and we celebrated. And my company gave me an award for, for handling the most pressure. And I really feel what I do under pressure is I tend to plan, plan well, tend to break it down into the smallest bits, try and be realistic about my estimates. So something like that, that employer mm. goes, okay, this person has got experience in pressure. Mm. Just something I learned only maybe quite a few years ago, but not, not when I started, is if you cannot give a good example of that technique. So somebody says, um, have, you, have you handled difficult clients? And you go, yes, I have. Give me an example. And you can't come up with an example it's possible or probable that you actually haven't got a lot of experience or you don't have mm. the skill of handling that. So I think mm. it's very important before, like Tess was saying, to be prepared. And you don't want to be prepared to be robotic, but you want mm. to be pre uh, prepared that you've thought about these questions enough. So if I were you, I would probably go out and Google top 10 interview questions, top 20 mm. interview questions, mm. and ask yourself those questions before and make sure you've got a, an answer that sits well with you, that's honest, that's um, mm. representative of how you are in the workplace. Hey, Tess. <laughs> absolutely. Lies, eh? <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think it's important that you give some thought to what is the best answer to describe what I'm good at? Have you expressed that well? Is that the best um, example to say that you've, you've been a manager, you've handled pressure? Um, because often people will have an answer, but it actually isn't their best. It's, it's not um, one, it, it doesn't go, well, yes, I want to hire you. Yes, you're going to come and make a difference in my company. So I think it's really, it's really important yeah, to give I those think. things some thought. Yeah. Absolutely. And then I think something that is often a deal breaker. So you go for the interview and the, the, the interviewer says, so what do you know about our company? Or even worse, you say, so what do you people do here? <laughs> so you need to Google the company before, find out yes. what does the company do, go onto their website, go onto their Facebook page, maybe take a few notes, maybe even bring that up in the interview. So for instance, you know, last week or on, on the weekend, while I was preparing for this interview, I was quite amazed to see that you're actually a multinational company with branches in Singapore and London. I had no idea, isn't that amazing? Or, or when they say, do you have any questions? I see you've got a, an employee advancement program, and that really excited me. Can you tell me what your training and development opportunities are? Wow, that's amazing, you know. But just a couple of things, uh, you know, I was talking to an employer the other day, and he said to me, if he's hiring a salesperson and they come in for an interview, he gives them a negative point if they haven't already tried to connect with him on LinkedIn. Um, and I thought that's interesting. So if you're in sales, you're a mover and a shaker, surely that is what you would do. That shows um, evidence of your ability to connect, network, and hustle, maybe. Um, things as well I also wanted to just mention. I remember my first interview. I was straight out of varsity. I wanted to become a recruiter. I went to an agency, and I literally froze. I had those blotches on my neck. I was sitting there. I couldn't. My mouth was dry. felt like the Sahara Desert. I couldn't think of anything. And afterwards, I was like, I was so cross with myself. And I think the thing is just to downplay it. I know we think this is life or death, but for that interviewer, you are one of several people, you know, um, and, you know, if you bomb this interview, you will have another one sometime. So I think don't, don't just sit there and go, everything's hing hinging on this one chance. Try and be more relaxed, anticipate what people are going to ask, <clears throat> put your best foot forward and do that by self-awareness. Ask those questions, my strengths, my weaknesses. But uh, Tess, tell me, is there mm. any weakness that you think people shouldn't say? <laughs> like, you know, let's be honest, we all have horrible weaknesses. And yes. like, I mean, it's, tell me, is there something that you as an interviewer, if somebody said, yes, um, have you got weaknesses? Yes, 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 I am, or I don't do this. What would you go, no, don't say that? 
well, there's a few. <laughs> Look, obviously, you're not going to see a weakness that's um, going to prevent you from getting a job. So, um, I mean, if you're applying for a admin um, post and you're going to say, well, Excel's my weakness, <laughs> it's not going to get you the post. So I think it's important to think of a weakness that um, you aware of, you, you know you can work on it, and um, but it's not going to cost you the job. So, I mean, I have a lot of students or um, my overseas students, they say uh, English is, is their um, weakness. And I'm like, you're applying for a position in a global company. You're not going to say English is your weakness. You're not going to get the job. Focus on the actual role at hand and, and where you feel you can improve in, in a specific skill or a specific area. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I think I, I just remember two situations in my past. The one, the one lady I interviewed, and I said, "What is your weakness?" And she said, "I'm very, very lazy." Oh. And uh, you wouldn't say that. I know none of you no. would say that. But, but, and then another situation I had where I interviewed a, a lady, and and I said, Do you, "What is there a weakness about you?" And she said, "Oh, I'm so moody. Nobody mm. wants that. Nobody wants that." No. So those, even if you are, don't include mm. those. I think rather include. Mm something that's more socially acceptable. So sometimes people will say, you know what, I'm actually impatient. And I feel mm. like that's a weakness because I, I, I want to get things done. Sometimes I'm impatient and then I'm hard on myself and I have unrealistic expectations. But I, mm. I have learned how not to be impatient with others because I mm. realize that my job is people facing. And so I find I tend to be more impatient with myself than with others. And I have learned the art of masking any irritation I might feel from time to time if I'm under pressure. So I think it's so important to kind of, if you've got a weaknesses, a weakness, which we all do, and please, mm. I mean, don't be that person that says, I've got no weaknesses. I once no, had a no. lady there say that, and I was shook her hand. I said, you're the first person I've ever met who's perfect. Wow. But I um, mean, we had a laugh. But I think it's important to let people know that mm. you're a balanced person. Nobody, mm. even anybody, even the 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 saint, the you know, the biggest saints in the world mm. have some weaknesses. And then mm. um, I think also just on that note, you know, many of us came onto the Zoom call today. Many of us are not entirely au fait with the technology. Tess, I mean, mm. you've 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 helped people, and I, um, I'm throwing this one at you, but. Any mm. little tips on the Zoom interview or on the Teams interview, maybe that people might not have even thought of, that you could just share, like, do this, don't do this, so they can help themselves put their, 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 that great first impression out there. Mm. I, th I think, you know, sometimes it might even be nice to have a practice run with a friend, even say to them, hey, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I don't really know how to do this technology. Can we have a, um, a, a trial run? Can we just practice so I can you know, see what I look like, um, you know, am, is my background nice, is it, is it okay, have I got a messy background, can you hear me, you know, almost do like a test run, I think that that's also important, and um, yeah, I, I'm not actually sure what else to add to that, I think we've covered quite a bit. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And I also think just with Zoom, mm. start the call, ideally mute yourself because often there's background noise and try yes. and avoid back, background noise. Like today, I'm working from home. I've closed two doors so that you hopefully won't hear my dog if, if he barks. <laughs> mm, um, mm. You know, I've heard people having really funny conversations and rude conversations um, before attending a Zoom call or a Zoom. Mm. And, and then sometimes what happens is the, the, the person arrives late so it gives the impression. Mm. Meanwhile, they're not late. They were just fumbling with the technology mm. and mm. they couldn't get onto the call. So it just, just gives the impression of the person is too, you know, uh, nobody likes, uh, everybody likes somebody who's punctual. Um, mm. I also think, so if you see right now, I am looking at the dot, okay? If you're interviewing, don't look at your own face and don't look mm. at the face of the interviewer. So Tess, I can mm. see in my bottom left, but I'm mm. actually looking at the dot. And, and apparently, if you want to be likable, okay? This I, I actually mm. only saw in a TED talk the other day. So imagine oh. now you, you, um, I'm in, you interviewing me and I go, hi, how are you doing? Apparently, when we go, put our hands out, look, no weapons, friend, friend, friend. So hi, and then afterwards, hi, but you don't want to be doing this because you're going to make the person mm. go dizzy. But um, I think it's so important. And, and 
you know, I, I know so many silly examples of people where they dress beautifully on the top, but not well on the bottom. And then they stand up or something. And then you see that they're wearing their pajamas. So I think it's just mm. all those things. But remember that you only have a few minutes at the most mm. three minutes to create that first impression. And if mm. you're going, um, uh, where's this thing? I don't know where it is. Um, mm. And you're chatting to help me, help me. You know, that person's like already put off. So it's so difficult. Mm. I really think it's difficult, but give yourself your best chance of success by being there, being calm, being composed, ready, big smile, eye contact, and try mm. not to fidget too much and move too much. Um, Tess, any other tips mm. on how people can find a job? Because I know it's it's so hard and, you know, I just wish we had loads of jobs. I must be honest, when mm. the market's good, we are heroes. You know, everyone's saying, mm. you guys are amazing. And then when the yeah. market's not good, it, it, it's so frustrating for everybody, us as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Any, any thoughts? Look, yeah, I, I think we, we have covered a lot of the points. I just think... Um, Yes, do connect with with recruitment with with recruiters and recruitment agencies. But also remember that we're also human. We are trying to help as many people as possible. Um, take on the tips of get your CV updated, and then again, just just network with your friends. Just get the word out. Um, I, I, and also just 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 keep looking on on the different platforms and and make sure you you have registered. On, on those different platforms as well. So just spread your, your market wide. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, also just a few things, you know, um, these might seem like weird suggestions that you might not have thought of. Now, I'm, I'm so aware that many people will take advantage of a job seeker. They'll say, ha ha, come and work for free, come and work for virtually nothing. Mm. But I think mm -hmm. there are times where it might be suitable. So I'll give you a few opportunities, uh, uh, examples so i hit up a charity it's called the robin hood foundation right we've had some people approach us and say listen i'm unemployed i'd love to volunteer and you know what happens they get to know people they grow their network they grow mm. their, con uh, their, their confidence they have a sense of purpose and suddenly they've got new skills to add to their cv and um, I, I must say, one of our volunteers sent me a, a message yesterday to say they're looking for work. And I was like, oh, you're amazing at X, Y, and Z. And I thought, that's that's awesome. I'm really going to try and see how I can help her, even if it's in my personal capacity. So growing your network. And you know that mm. saying, your network equals your net worth. How many people know you? And, and as I said mm. earlier, you've had two years wherein it's been almost impossible to grow your network in person. So... Have you contacted ex-employers to say, hi, I'm available. Do you know anybody that um, could use me? And that's where not burning bridges comes in. You want to leave every job with a situation that even though you don't want to go back, that you, you leave in a way that would have you back. And remember when we ask uh, the, one, the one deal breaker question I ask in references is, I don't care about everything else except that last question, would you re-employ? And if mm. there's hesitation and if there's a no, everything else means very little to me. So you always want to leave a job in that way. So if you can connect with your old, old clients, people that you've worked with, even from your education, your old lecturers, your old, any old teachers, old principals, I'm looking. Those people know who you really are. I think that's important. Mm. Friends and mm. family, you know, sometimes you've got, you've got a friend who works in a big company or somebody who's in HR or somebody who owns a business, you know, be bold, be brave. Mm. Um, a lot of people go, oh, I'd never thought of that. Oh, I'm too scared. And, you know, there's that saying, timid salesmen have skinny kids. We want big kids. <laughs> so we mustn't be timid. You know, oh, yes, I've thought of that person. I felt too embarrassed. Well, you know, don't be embarrassed. Go out there and say, I'm available. I want to tell you something that happened in the year 2000. This is how old I am. I'm remembering stories from 2000. But it was the, the IT wave. Remember the, the Y2K? So it was actually in 1999. We had a corporate company that used us for a whole bunch of IT temps. Anyway, at the same time that they took on these temps that we were paying an hourly rate, there were these two guys who approached this IT company and they said, we want to work for free. We want to work because we, we need skills Anyway, three months later, the IT company approached me and said, we've got these two guys. Do you mind putting them on your payroll? These two guys are working better than anybody else. We are back paying them for the work they did. 
And I thought, wow, you know, these guys took a chance. And fair enough, I don't always advocate it because you might end up being exploited. But here's the thing. Say, for instance, you've got an Excel course or a, a zero course or you've, you've got pastel or you've got a skill, but you haven't, you haven't um, polished it up. You don't have enough experience. It might actually be in your best interest to say to somebody, um, can I work in your accounts department for a month for free? I know it might sound crazy, but after a month, you've learned the skill in practice. You can get a reference from those people and you never know. You, if you put your best foot forward, they might take you on. And then the other thing to consider is so many times people go, I'm looking for a permanent job. Of course, we all want a permanent job, but there's also something to be said about temporary work and um, contract work as well. So how can I do temporary or contract work? And then another thing I wanted to share with you is we're living in the slashy age where I do this, slash this, slash this. So for instance, even if you look at me, I own a recruitment business, so I've got recruitment. I do business coaching. I've just written a new book, so I'm an author. I'm a motivational speaker. Um, I also own property. I head up a charity. So if you look at my roles, I've got this, slash this. You might find that, um, you know what, I do admin. I might want to become a VA and be a virtual assistant. I might offer that service from home because I've got a computer and I'm available and you could maybe market yourself. You might find that you also do something entrepreneurial, like turning a craft into a business. And I just wanted to just give a minute to this because I feel like so many people are saying the answer to me and my situation is that somebody must employ me. If there were no jobs, how can you employ you? What do you have in your head, your heart, and your hands? And, and I, I, I'm sure if I'd love to see it in the chat, and I'm actually going to give one of you a book. I'm going to courier it to your house, one of these answers. Okay. Um, and I've just written this book. It's called How Does She Do It? And what does it say? A behind the scenes look at the world of a female entrepreneur trying to balance work, life, family, and everything in between. So this book, you're going to get a copy. One of you, I'm going to choose from the chat. But I want to ask you a question because I feel like I've been an entrepreneur for 28 years. Um, I've started quite a few little businesses and loads and loads of initiatives. What do you do that you do so well, you wonder why other people don't do it or can't do it? What do you do that when you do it, time flies and you think, oh my gosh, what do you do that you would do it even if you weren't paid? Mm. I'd love to see some of those comments. Um, and I'll give you examples. I know people who cook really, really well. They love cooking. I know people who love um, clothing and they, may, they, they can sew and they can make things. I was talking to a friend yesterday who started a business. She crochets Christmas ornaments. You won't believe this, but she crochets these reindeers. <laughs> she left a corporate job at one of the top uh, construction companies and she now creates products that are handmade. And she said, guess what? All I'm doing right now, it's January and I'm making reindeers. <laughs> but there she is. I knew of a lady who was a creditor's clerk. She started beading. She did so well, she developed a little Facebook page. She did so well, she ended up giving up her job in the big motor industry that she was in to carry on her business. Now, so many of us have forgotten those dreams. We've gone, you know, we're feeling despondent. We're feeling frustrated. But there is no, there's, you know, we, we're kind of tired. Tara said in the beginning, she's been selling coffee. How does she turn that into a business? Is there a business? Is there a market? Um, I know many, many examples of people who during this lockdown and, and this, this pandemic lost their jobs because the companies were closing down or companies were reducing. And they, they out of desperation or out of necessity, they said, well, I can cook. Um, and they suddenly have started catering businesses or I know how to make clothes and they suddenly started clothing ranges. So I bet that on this call, there are one or two people who've got a skill. Tess, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, that's a, a great idea. It, um, you know, you, you, you can turn small businesses to have a little side hustle, start something. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's also, it's, it's a way of, of marketing and getting yourself out there as well and, and speaking to people. So, yes, I, I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. And if anyone's got any skills that they think they could possibly turn into a business, I'd love to see it because a book's up for grabs. I just wanted to deal with the questions mm. here. Uh, Tess, can you answer this one? Uh, Cornell was just saying, how do you put a CV together and highlight 
30 years of experience in a short CV, not 30 pages. What are your tips? Mm. Anything there? Yes, sure. I think it, it depends on, on what you're actually wanting to highlight. Is it, is it the same experience of when you're saying 30 years or have you done different things in those 30 years? So um, no, you definitely don't want to go more than two pages or and you just need to highlight the, the key areas that you've, you've focused on. Um, and then you put you know, an average length of a CV, yes, one or two pages, not definitely not longer than that. Yeah. So he's definitely going to need to highlight what those um, years of experience are. I mean, is it is it the same thing? Has he been in the same business or has he done different things? Yeah. And that's important just to uh, put those in, in points. But yeah, I think you you can't have you can't depending on how many jobs he's actually done as well it depends on his, what his actual cv says absolutely i know that some candidates say this is my brief condensed cv knowing that most employers want something mm. short but if you'd like i can send you my detailed full detailed cv with yes. with references and certificates and what have you on so mm. i think that's so important um yeah, uh, yeah. and then um sorry tess another question mm. here was i thought um uh, can you put salary negotiable? I think you can, but you would need to say what your expectation is. So if yeah. you have, you know, to, because negotiable, what is negotiable? 10,000 Rand, 20,000 Rand, 30,000 Rand. What is the, what is negotiable on, on, on a certain amount? So you need to have a, a within a, within a range. Absolutely. And then how hmm. can graduates market themselves? Um, the one thing I know is we actually do a lot of speaking for various uh, colleges like Mancosa, Regent, Varsity College. And I know hmm. those organizations, if you are a product of those organizations, they have in-house recruitment, free service for, for the grads that, that will help you. But I think with graduates, I think it's it's an important thing to definitely get onto LinkedIn. I think that's an important thing mm. as well. But definitely. also, you know, to position yourself. And, and I think something that many job seekers don't understand is the power of your brand. Every mm. single thing you do or don't do either diminishes or, or increases your brand. So, you mm. know, if, you, if I were a young graduate right, right now, and say I'd studied law, let's just say for, for want of a better word. And you know what? I would probably start creating a, I'd clean up my social media. Firstly, I would look at mm. it and say, think of those dodgy posts I've done and, and kind of clean it up um, mm. or make my personal Facebook uh, account private. Um, mm. well, you know, so make sure that my social media is speaking to the professional that I'm now becoming or want to be seen mm. as. I would also start writing blogs um, or start writing. Um, and and sharing um, you know um, things that are that are are related to my degree, so people start seeing me as in that um, category. I would start connecting with people in my industry, and and um, and maybe commenting on their posts as well, and just you know connecting like that. I would contact the agencies that are specialists in my area. So I'd look who does legal recruitment if I'm in legal. You know, I'd also look at and see where do those people network? Can I network with them? Can I join an industry body? And also online, there are lots and lots of online groups as well. I think that's important as well. And um, yeah, and I think it's, it, and, and ask, you know, there's nothing stopping you emailing and, and contacting uh, various firms directly to say, are you looking? Mm. I think um, this is why I would love to work for you. Uh, Ke Ke Kelly said, I don't have a degree, but I do have more than 16 years experience in the marketing field. Most applications are online. And I think because I don't tick the degree box, I don't get to move forward. Any advice on uh, advice on countering this, Tess? Yeah, that's, that is a tough one because I know a lot of clients are looking for qualifications. And yes, it, it, it does... Um, unfortunately, untick you there. But there are some positions that don't require um, qualification and, and it is based on experience. I think there you're going to actually need to try and go directly as opposed through um, the, the, the actual um, site as such, because yes, you won't, you won't have an opportunity, you won't go through. So I think you've just got to highlight your actual experience and um, yeah, that, that is a difficult one. Yeah. Um, um, I must say from our point of view as a recruitment agency, 
a lot of our candidates don't have degrees and but mm. they've got a great CV they've mm. got a history of progression in their CV they've got great references um, they interview well and you know often for many clients it's can the person do the job so I yeah. think I'd, I wouldn't say that that should be against you um, also mm. you know you can always if applying for a, d- a degreed role so let's just say it's a marketing role for a graduate with to say I'm not a graduate however I have extensive experience in A, B and C and um, I bring to the company maybe highlight two ma- your, of your best achievements or your top mm. achievement and maybe, you know, and also sometimes one might assume that if people are saying we, we need a, a, a graduate, they're wanting somebody um, maybe more junior or more or younger, but what you could then mm. say is I'm highly um, energetic and enthusiastic and passionate and, you know, I'm a mm. team player and put that across as well in the, in the, in the, in, in the CV. I- I, yeah. I think then an, an, an agency is actually can be more beneficial um, to Kelly because then obviously we speak to the client directly so we could also market her in a certain way. So yes, depending on, on what skills she has, yes. then perhaps the, the qualification isn't uh, as necessary. Absolutely, I think so. Mm. And, and just, uh, just anybody else, is, does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question? We've got five minutes left if anybody would like to. You're most welcome to do that. Tess, do you mind putting your mm. email address in the in the chat? If anybody has, uh, uh, Cornell, sure. you're welcome to unmute yourself, or I can unmute you if you. Oh, there you go. Oh, hi guys. Hello there. Hi. hi. Um, yeah, thank. Oh, let me just put the video on. Uh, just hold on a sec. Um. Yeah, so obviously long in the tooth in the business industry. Um, can can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you yes. perfectly. You hear me fine. Okay, so so the reason why I asked the questions earlier is because uh, I've been uh, I, I took up a contract for a British company last year, um, March timeframe. It was a six month contract. I thought they were going to extend it. But due to the riots that we had in uh, July, it caused a major problem for them, and they didn't extend the contract. Um, hence, I had to go back out to look for work again. Um, as a solutions architect in the IT and, and telecom space, um, I don't know if there's many solutions architects out there that's looking for jobs, but I, I, I just find that People get hold of me, employment agents get hold of me, either via LinkedIn or via PNET or wherever. My CV is just all over the, just about every job site that there is. Um, and they, they read the CV and they say, yes, you, you're just the person that my client's actually looking for. That's as far as it goes. Okay. I don't even get as far as getting an interview with a client. And that's frustrating because I'm thinking, and when I go back, to the people, they either give me a like a weird answer of, um, you know what, they found someone internal, or yeah. um, you just don't believe it. They, yeah, and they yeah. or they felt that um, maybe the salary, and that's why I put up about the salary negotiation yeah. because a lot of mm-hmm. them assume what salary you want. Now, if you're out of a job for four years, uh, for four yeah. months, and you're looking, I'm willing. As, as a normal salary for solutions architects around about 60K a month. Yeah. And that's why I always put um, negotiable, negotiable because I'm yeah. saying, if you can't afford 60K, tell me what you can afford yes. so, you that, want to be so that I can match you yes. um, and see if it's going to work for us. And, but and I don't Cornel, even you get sound? as far as an interview stage. And that to me is very frustrating. How old are you, Cornell? 55 and okay. a white male <laughs> yeah no I, I don't even think the white male is a, as big a thing as age and and I have to say this you know I think I think what we find is employees can be incredibly discriminatory in so many ways and and I do think age I don't know if you've come across it you might find you know a lot of these IT companies are are 
are cool and sexy and young and dynamic. You know what I'm talking about? And then they, yeah. they go, oh, you've got the skills. Oh, a little bit older than we think, you know? And or if we can find somebody maybe half your age with, with twice as much experience. So I do think we do live in a very, very ageist society. I mean, I'm over 50 myself and I've seen it with clients where they go, nobody over 50, nobody. And, and you know, you go, why? You know, what has it got to do? Can can the person do the job? So I think we need a, a re-education of, of people at the moment to to really question their biases, whatever they are. You know what I mean? So, so uh, uh, you know, I've heard it all in my in my time. So you might find that people are looking at your ID number and going, they're working out, oh, he is quite a mature candidate. So what are the presumptions about mature candidates? They set in their ways. They're too expensive. They, 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 they're not going to fit in with our dynamic culture. So you might find it's that kind of nonsense that, and then people don't even meet you, you know, so... So, you know, and, and that's, it's very hard to fight that, you know, as such. And I'm sure everybody on this call has felt that there's been some form of bias against something. Oh, you're too junior. You don't have enough experience. You don't have a degree. You're too old. You're too whatever. And, and unfortunately, for every person, there's a bias. And even if it's an unconscious one. So um, maybe on your CV, you might, Cornell, just a thought, you might want to just put there in the front at the top, um, you know, um, I am highly negotiable on salary due to the fact that um, we are, you know, uh, in, in uh, very difficult um, uh, times or due to the fact that my contract has expired. Um, I'm very happy to get into the job market. I'm very negotiable and I'm very adaptable, agile. You know, those are the things people are wanting. And often people wrongly assume that somebody on the wrong side of 50 doesn't have that. You know, and 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 you might find that that that's what you what you're coming up against, or there's that perception that gosh, this guy's worked for look at these top companies, he's way out of our league. So you might want to indicate a salary range, you know, just so that people, you know, it's like uh, Cornell. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you want to order the seafood and or something and it says SQ and you know it's going to be expensive, so you don't order it because you're too scared to ask how much it is. So I think yeah. it's that kind of thing where you kind of like. You know, you might find by putting a salary range there and by even stating the facts, I know you might think that I'm, I'm, I'm mature, but let me tell you what I do bring to the party. I bring 30 years experience. I bring, um, you know, so, you know, these are my X factors, you know, mm. and and I'm happy to 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 try out. I'm happy to, you know, to come in for an, on a working interview. You know, I think I think we've got to try and box really clever right now. Um, and and yeah, so I think. Um, it's tough. It's tough for everyone. I would love you to send me your CV because we we do get enrolled in that in that space. My CV, my email address is here. Um, I can see what yeah, you can sure. do in that space. I'll, I'll send yeah. it to you. Yeah, and if anyone on this call feels that they've got skills that people really need and that, that an agency can help with, you're welcome to send to Tess or myself. We will be honest with you. You know, we're not here to waste your time and make false promises, but you can send to one or the other. Um, and we'll hopefully respond within uh, 48 hours or thereabouts, um, because obviously we're working on a lot of roles at the moment. But um, I, we, we've reached 11.02, and um, I, I, I think we, bet, we better end off. Anything else from you, Tess, uh, before we go? No, I, I think um, I think we've covered most of most of the things. And yes, you are more than welcome to to email. I'm happy to respond to any emails that, or any questions that people have. Fantastic, Tess. And, and you might find that you might have sat there and thought, oh, my question's so dumb. I, I feel awkward to ask it. There are no awkward questions. There are no silly questions. There might be your questions. And then I don't know who's on our phone, but I'm going to give the person on our phone a book because they're the only one who told me what they're good at. Um, so if you can, the person who's on our phone, email me and you will get a free copy. Of, uh, email me with your physical address and I will courier a copy of my book to you. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you got a few little tips that might help you. Um, I know we can't cover everything in such a short time, but I really hope that we've added a little bit of value and hopefully a little bit of reassurance that, you know, just keep doing the right thing. Um, and yeah, you know, as I say, we, we uh, the market isn't as bad as people think. Um, there, there are jobs coming in. Um, you know, I think it's 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 definitely it's definitely not as bad as people think. But you've got to have a multi-pronged approach. We are one part of a 
of a 12 piece puzzle, if you know what I mean, we as agencies and don't just go to one, go to as many as possible. If you mm-hmm. Google how many recruitment agencies are in just greater Durban area, you'll be shocked. There are so many. So um, I think I think that's that's uh, that's to me is encouraging. Uh, if we're all in business, it means there's enough jobs out there. Um, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate it. And um, this will be put up on our website as well. So if you attended late or if you know somebody who didn't attend but who would like to, if you go onto our Facebook page by this afternoon or by tomorrow morning, it will be put up and you can share it or you can visit it again. So thank you very, very much. Tess, thank you for your time. I know you're really sure. hectic with all of the specs you're working on. So thanks for giving up your time. Um, I know you do this um, all the time with candidates all over the world. So um, we're really fortunate to have Tess give us her expertise as well. And everybody, we just really wish you all the best. And um, and don't don't personalize it. It's not you. There's it a hundred other reasons why you might not be getting the job. And a lot of it is completely out of your control. Um, and then, as I said, I encourage you, think about those skills and abilities you have. You might just have something that's a little gem that that you could use as part of your income. It might not be your whole income, but isn't it exciting when you've got a hobby that that, that pays you um, a salary, um, which I think is amazing. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.